Today we're looking at a recent project on a H-bridge design. This IC here does the trick for us, the DRV8835, which is this section over here. An IC capable of driving two motors or one by placing the outputs in parallel, which increases its current handling ability. So by diving into the schematic, we see it being controlled by the MCU, which is a STM32F0, and it's the same one being used in the gas sensor project. Now even though this was a smallish project compared to what you see here on the overview page, I still wanted to separate things out to give clarity into the schematic. Your schematic should aim to be as clear and readable as possible as you won't be the only one reading it. And as well it allows people to pick up on mistakes more easily, if any. Though I'm sure yours passed the first time. In the overview page here, we have the power section, a microcontroller, the H-bridge itself and the sensors. These added sensors were added for learning purposes, which are a temperature and humidity sensor and a pressure sensor. Didn't really play any part in this whole creation besides for learning purposes. But to kick things off, we'll start at the H-bridge section over here. The H-bridge is the main topic for today, and this H-bridge is a piece of circuitry that allows users to control the direction of a motor. The H-bridge here, I've added current sensors to see what the current draw of the load is. I'm planning to use a power supply to run the motor, so my power supply will tell me how much current these motors are actually pulling and by having this current sensor amplifier I can make quick references to ensure that my firmware is going to be correct. Which Looking at the data sheet here we see multiple configuration for this H-bridge here. We can have it in different modes depending on what function you want it to have, forward, reverse, brake and coast. So here we have this simplified schematic of how the device is to function and within its application and implementation we can see it's telling us that we can configure it in parallel as we mentioned to double the current to one motor or we can just have it to, to two as shown in the simplified schematic. Take note that we have two different things here so we can control these individually or we can have four lines going into depending on what mode that we want so again looking at this table here we can see what what mode we can place our motor into as i mentioned before we can put it in coast reverse forward or brake or if we just put it into phase enable mode we could have brake reverse or forward coming back to our schematic over here i've decided to opt for the ic itself and not for the standard h bridge which makes use of four different fets i believe two two p channels two n channel fets comparison to a normal h bridge done using discrete component we would need to add extra components such as the flyback diode a uh, bulk capacitance and perhaps bridge drive to prevent shoot through and this happens when both the low side and high side fets are turned on at the same time but however if we had something that could adhere to our project requirements and it's an ic and had everything integrated i would always recommend to choose the ic over the discrete components sure you could do it sure it would make total sense and work the same way but why not just keep things simple and lower down your total cost of components and how many components you have on the board which leads to the rate of failure being lower taking note that i've also started stating the designators in their hundreds region where the number corresponds with the schematic number so as you can see here i've got c301 c300 r300 this means the component is on page three of the schematic taking a look over here Despite Altium putting 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and so on, it's just a number of pages. But I've, I tend to put 0 for the overview page and working my way up. And this helps me refer when I come to layout that I know if a component is wrong or I want to, you know, misplace, change the value, I know where to look for. Instead of if I compare it to had C, starting from C0 or 1 to C50, it takes me a while to find it. Of course, Altium has even built uh, crossover looking tools to make it easier. Now we're jumping between different schematics here. But going over to the sensors, you can see I've labeled down what each individual sensor is, the port it's going to be using, and as well I've net labeled them. Again, I've net labeled them to know what I'm actually routing, and it's good practice to do so. So I'm employing these harnesses here to make things nice and tidy. And so you can see over in the overview page, you could see that these harnesses here, they link directly to the mic controller, giving your user a good, good readability on how everything's going to work, a very top level overview. I highly recommend doing. Putting the I2C1 refers to the ports that I would like to use for the firmware. So within the, the data sheet, it might be said, I'd swear to see one underscore SDA, SCL, so on and so forth. And this is how I would use it. So perhaps in a different in a different project, I was using the UART port and UART is a single ended, you know, going to from one device to another. You can't put multiple on the same bus. But by, have, by saying, oh, I want to use one as UART one, this one UART two, I can clearly identify to the person I'm working with or for myself that I want to use these ports. Also included a little bit of notations into what the address of these certain sensors is. This is just for ease of reference, something I like to do. And any unknown pins or something that may be confusing, I've also put a little note, it can't hurt. So by saying what, if you, so for example, CSB, something you don't really C, but it actually refers to the last bit in the I squared C address. Again, lots of the configurations for these can be found in the data sheet for their typical application circuit, which should be used to get your product from a, an idea or prototype too quickly to getting a working something. 
now that we've done all that let's start with the power circuit so the power circuit for this project is only going to be using USB-C there's no battery there's no rechargeable circuit it's just going to be a plug-in and use it from there USB-C there's certain things you need to keep aware of for example that there's there's uh, 5k1 resistors that you need to pull down for using power purposes and as well over the differential pairs for the data lines if you are using them uh, for me I'm not using them so I've decided to put I'm not sure how it's the best way to do it, but I've put a zero ohm resistor in case I need to change it, but I've tied them to ground. I would hope it works okay. Uh, for micro USB, I've always had them floating, but I don't know how this works. It could be something different. But like I said before in the previous video, if you're not sure, place a zero ohm resistor there, and you can see, you can find out, you can usually make slight adjustments to it just because you have them pads easy to reroute things or place it. Placing the V USB line, I've come into a TVS dial here. And this is for ESD protection, and I highly recommend you do this. Uh, some people have not encountered ESD, you know, they, they don't really need it, they feel. Uh, but I feel that for, for such a cheap component, it, you might as well place it to protection, because the last thing you want is, you know, you get an ESD event, your whole circuit gets fried, and you've lost out, you know, you've, you've paid for the boards, the components, and whatnot. So why not just place it there? I think it's also good practice to get into a habit of, there's also multiple ways to... To do this so you might see one with a capacitor usually on the reset line you might just see a series resistor and a capacitor so it's a whole lot of different ways depending on what you want to do but generally for every connector that you have going to the outside world or interface or for example buttons usb lines especially and so on and so forth you would have special tvs dials for them now what i mean by special is that there are some protocols that are faster than others let's take for example hdmi which is quite a fast you know, it's a fast signal rate and you would have special TVS things just made for HDMI purposes as some of the capacitance or whatever inside this TVS can maybe skew up the lines and you're not expecting what you might expect. Coming in down we see I've put a Pi filter here this is just a standard Pi filter I can't remember the exact color frequency for this but I believe it's just something generic that I've put in and really I should have placed in the cutoff frequency here as I, like I've done for this Pi filter over here to give the user like a good value of what is actually going on but if that was running into trouble with this with this circuit here maybe the device wasn't powered because of this filter I could easily just replace it and then put something else in to get working again place two test points here to find out the difference of noise if I think that's how it works if not it's there anyway Again, going in into here, I've placed net labels and standard decoupling capacitors. And coming into here, just another Pi filter V out. This is actually a buck boost converter, and as opposed to a buck converter, because I know this design works, and so I've reused it. It's quite a common thing you will see is that you should always try to reuse your design if you know that works to cut down your design process and you know the whole component creation and everything. You might argue, oh, but I can just take components and, you know, less my time. I want to learn some more things. It's like, yes, that was all good. I feel the same as you did. Though you'll reach a point where you just <laughs> kind of just get lazy and, you know, you think, I know component that works. It saves me the debugging process if there is. So why not just use it? But had I done this properly, I would have used the buck converter instead. Just because I only have 5 volts coming in and I just need to have to step down to 3v3. Again, net labels on everything that I deem is important. So VL, the feedback line, especially the switching of the inductor that is important to keep to keep in mind of call the frequency 2.5 megahertz because the buck boost converter is switching at 2.5 megahertz so we're trying to reduce that noise as much as we possibly can moving to the microcontroller see a bit of things going on so let's take a closer look into it for power we have our 3v3 being filtered through some decoupling capacitors as per we have a big bulk capacitor over here and again reference designs were used for this as crystal uh, crystal as suggested per the data sheet nrio is nothing too fancy going on here Again, I'm labeling that label to give each I.O. giving me an idea of what I am routing, but also clear definition to the reader. Notice again, I've placed headers to what small portions of circuitry does and know what I'm doing. And a good as good practice, I would say this is really good, gives readability and you know what. If Imagine if all of these were removed, I wouldn't know like what this is. Well, what are these buttons doing? Are they just standard buttons? What does this LED have any indication for? And what is this connector here? Again, these harnesses were employed and you can see them connected. And this is how they're connected through. So with ports, they are connected for the entire project, but net labels are only to the local schematic. So for example, if you tried, if I just put net labels on the mode pin for this H-bridge control on this H-bridge side, this would not transfer over to my MCU side. You would need to put a port or something of that sort. And again, you could just put ports like this, but I feel it's more tidier and neater if you had a big section put in the harness so it only puts one output out. Again, it's down to personal preference and what you feel. But what I would say is always include these cross references when you do. Do not turn these off because then you can easily find out where things are going to, especially in, when you export this to a PDF and you need to show it to someone else or something like that. Or when you come back to it. Standard JTAG header, LED indicator, user button reset. And even though I didn't plan on using any of these 
buttons or whatnot i believe it's always good to have to always try and squish some io in for an led you can use it for so much when it comes to the debugging process as well just for it's always a nice to have the same as a user button believe me you'll be very grateful when you keep this in the lcd screen here i've also added as a as a header so if you want to connect more sensors on the i squared c bus but as well i wanted to put one of them 0.91 inches lcd those OLED ones that you see commonly used in Arduino projects and such. Overall, I would say this schematic is, is quite clean in uh, comparison to my other pieces of work. And you can definitely see the difference. So I'm going to put up a poor example of a schematic shown up here. So here we are in good old paint. And we're going to look at over the some, some parts of the schematic that would I feel that is honestly terrible practice and should not do and you should avoid. Of course, everything is looking at you and you could probably identify several hundred things that is wrong. But let's get into it. So we'll start from the left here because everything's a mess. First, we have a 24 volt bu boost converter. Sorry, this is this is good. You know, this is this is a good thing. We know what this circuit is doing. It gives us a clear indication. So we know this is a 24 volt boost converter coming in from the VBAT line. Honestly, I would start putting plus VBAT just as a clear indication here. Okay, 22, 22 microfarads, two of them going in. I presume decoupling. No net labels though, but. The VBAT will do this, but no net labels here. So again, when it came to routing, it would be something like J6 to J5, something like that. Coming in through here, we see the ground is pointing up. This is kind of just a, a little annoyance, I would say. I would always rotate them down, so I'd always have the ground here. And of course, this was done by yours truly, so things have changed now. And I've learned that put these ground here for make it easy, easy to read. Now, coming into here, you see a whole load of errors already. Different size capacitors so you can see that there's a there's a difference in the gap in between them keep your values the same not values sorry keep the sizes of your components the same just looking it looks very amateurish it looks quite disgusting personally not proud of this one but we live and learn and to see that if you keep it unique and overall it makes it does make it look easier to read and it's easy on the eyes you know and that's what that's what the aim of the game here also again not just the capacitors resistors all different sizes and you may think why is it all different sizes and such well it's because you've I've dragged components in from the altium manufacturer i think if you're using KiCad, you could also download components from the from like mauser's download components or websites like ultra librarian or snap eda which i do not recommend doing always build your own components for this very reason and to assume that the footprints are right when you make them what's even worse is that we have different symbols so you can draw a resistor like this or like this i prefer to draw them like this but again because laziness caught up with me this is not good practice to have different symbols all over the place as i mentioned before net labels all good what is good is that the calculations were here so i know what's going on i can see these numbers how how these values were calculated that is good but there's no calculation for this part over here. And you look into it, it's an enable line. It looks like a standard voltage divider for a 3v3. But I would still like to see them calculations there for that purpose. I believe the pins could have been adjusted a bit more correctly. So left to right. So input comes out here. Outputs come out here. Instead, I've just got inputs, then outputs. And then all the little stuff like uh, the setting, the frequency, the e-pad and uh, uh, analog ground, power ground, this all could have done much more neater, leading to a much more cleaner schematic. So the MCU is powering up, again, this H-bridge, or microcontroller is allowing this H-bridge to be configured differently so we can drive our motor forward from reverse and so on. Again, TVS styles on that end, current sense amplifiers, and this is all that there is to it. I've added test points nearly everywhere for this purpose as I have used this in the past on an evaluation board, but this is the first time I'm placing it on an actual board. And I always recommend to place these test points as they will help so much. Imagine if you didn't, you needed to know an error, but you can't because you don't have a test point and you would probably cut up, cut off like layers on the, on your board. You don't really want to do that. If you had them there, it would have been so much better. So do include them while you can. Sensors again, nothing much to it. We've already been through this. And if we go back to the overpage, overview page, this is how the whole circuit ends up looking at.